And I was uh, born in Can Cantonment, Oklahoma, which is uh, uh, three or four miles northwest of Canton, Oklahoma. About two miles west of Canton Lake, Oklahoma. I was born November 28, 1935, in my grandmother, grandfather's house. Uh, her name was uh, Masata Summers. Grandfather I didn't know because he had passed on. His name was Abe Summers. And uh, I was raised there and uh, I was old enough to go to school. First year, I think, I went to uh, a one-room school called Wildcat School. And it had all 12 grades in one room. We had to walk at least, you know, five miles within an hour. It was the school law at that time. So uh, Grandma and Grandfather said, uh, well, you can ride horses, you know, so let's give them a horse of their own. And so I could start riding a horse bareback. And I was riding a horse to school and back, and we trained the horse. After I got off, let him go, and he'd go back home. And my dad would have a bucket of oats for him, so that's what they went back for. And then uh, he would come and pick us up by horseback. That was some fun. Oh, the times were hard, you know, because uh, they didn't have the road system or tra transportation. We didn't have any electricity in the house. We all had coal oil plant, lamps and so forth and carry the water in from the well and all this and that. And then we had the outhouse, typical, <laughs> in the back. <laughs> that used to be quite an ordeal to go out to the bathroom in the middle of the night and so forth. But uh, the horses we had, my sister, two sisters had their own horses. We had names for them and so forth. And, uh, we carry our books, and uh, lunch was provided by a farmer who lived close by. And uh, I don't know how they took care of that, but it was quite an experience that first year. My main tutor, his name was uh, uh, Bo coming up, and he's the one that really learned a lot from, about the, the ethics, morals, and everything, how to be a good person, how to walk, you know, when you meet an elder, left, to the left, one step behind, and never go across around in front of them, you know, to the right or left, always wait for them and all this and that. And he taught all this real manners. And uh, said that it just stuck with me. And uh, the one thing he really taught, he said, grandson, if you ever start something, finish it. And I said, what do you mean finish? He said, finish what you're gonna do or let it finish you. And it took me a long time to understand that. And I followed, he says, then, you know, that went on for years and uh, always stuck with me and still does. And then, uh, of course, you know, I got to tell this one about this, the second time I went to public school, Lawndale. Traditionally, you know, I had long hair, braids, I had braids, pigtails. My grandfather wanted me to be a powwow, my grandmother wanted me to be a medicine man. And my mother said, no, he's going to be educated. And uh, so we went to school at Lawndale, and we caught a bus because it was six miles away. And uh, so the second or third day, I got into a fight with the white kids over a swing. And uh, I said, our kids, he said, our kids need to s swing over here where there's no water and mud, and it's not broken down. And they said, no, you're not. So a couple of white guys grabbed me, they grabbed my braids. They had me between, it was pulling me, you know, they were... The third one was hitting me and beating me up. And uh, finally, I st they stopped and the recess was over. And uh, they went and told the teacher that I started it. Well, I did. I told them I was going to take that swing. The second day, they did the same thing. I would go home and tell Grandma and my mother and father, said, I got to get rid of these braids. You know, and I didn't tell them why. So they said, no. I said, you keep them. The fourth day I went to school, uh, they, did the, they tried to do the same thing again. And then I found that weekend, I went to the barn and I cut my braids off. <laughs> and I took them and I gave them to my grandfather. <laughs> they didn't like that. They said, what did you do that for? Well, Monday morning I went to school at Lawndale. I got into a fight with those boys again. They tried to grab my hair and they couldn't grab it. And I whipped them off. And I won that swing. And then says, well, you just stand up to them and don't back down. You can get what you want. And that's what old man Bull come and told me, my tutor. He said, stand up to them. Stand on your ground. 
Uh, we were aware of it on a bus. Uh, we had to sit in the back, so forth. And uh, the bus driver always tells us to make sure all the Indian kids are sitting in the back. And when I got on the bus, I'd look and they would all be back there. They would be sitting on each other's lap, you know, even though there were too many Indian kids to sit on that one row. But we all squeezed back there. And uh, this one particular morning, uh, got on the bus and it was all packed back there. And there was one seat right directly behind the uh, uh, bus driver. That one 19 year old white bus driver, his name was Waverly Pollock. I remember him. He's gone now, but, and I told him this when he began to lease my land, and I told him what he did to me. So I got on the bus, and I was standing there, and, I, and uh, the Indian kids were waving at me, and then this little white girl sitting there, she was a space for her, right there. She said, come on, come on. So I went and sat down, you know, thinking of it, you know, and we started going, and the other white kids reminded the bus driver, and he turns around, he looks at me, he's uh, Virgil, he said, well, you know your place. Now get back there. And I was getting ready to get, get up, and he slapped me. Not once, but the, sec the second time, he knocked me out of the seat and onto the floor. And I'm laying there crying, you know, you know, six, seven years old, and big old, you know, 19-year-old. He's an ad adult at the time. And he said, now get back there, you know. And so I realized, you know, this is the power that Grandpa had been talking about. So I got up, and... Uh, one of the Indian girls come over and she grabbed me and, she's, and he started to hit her, but he stopped. He never hit her, but he did push her, but, you know, so we went back and sat down. Years later, this man that slapped me became a leaser, and I reminded him of that. And he said, I apologize to you. He said, I didn't know it was you. He said, is there anything you want? I thought about it, but I didn't. I said, I could have had a new pickup. Anything in his house, and he said, he said, I'm sorry. I said, no problem. He said, just pay me my lease money and I'll be all right. <laughs> old school was across the creek, or they call the old school there. Uh, they put me in, a, I think I was the fifth grade, and I spent the whole year there. And uh, as soon as my grandmother and grandfather had moved, went to Montana to visit their relatives, and, and meanwhile, my mother and father put me in control of school. <laughs> So I wouldn't be a bother to them, you know, financially and all this. And because uh, they drank quite heavily. They were into alcohol pretty bad. And so they put me and my two sisters in the country school. And like, they kept my younger brother. And uh, Grandma was my son in summer since in Montana for the whole year. And I would finish the whole fifth grade year at country school. And when she came back in the summer, she came and got me and took me out. And I went back to public schools. And uh, so that was an experience I had to learn how to live in a boarding school. Never, never realizing that later on, I was going to become a teacher in the school. And uh, I think that's quite an experience. It really helped me later. Because when I started applying for different jobs, you know, openings for administrators, I said, hey, I went to boarding school, and I'm also a teacher in a boarding school, and I also went to public school, and uh, I know what, both sides. And uh, I landed the, bis the biggest job I had as a Sequoia Indian High School in Tahlequah for the Cherokee Nation. And uh, I enjoyed that. Well, well, the thing that kept me in high school was playing football for El Reno High School. And uh, those were the places I made the good grades. <laughs> and then shop. The only place I made A's and the others, you know, were just borderline. I kept those grades up just so I could continue to play and so forth. And uh, my counselor, Mr. Durham, who was my counselor, he said, virtually, he said, if you try as hard as you do playing football or basketball, you'd be making straight A's. I said, oh, I just want to play ball, you know, and that's all. And uh, he said, well, don't ever think about going to college. And boy, when somebody tells me that, that's a challenge. I said, wow, you know, I thought to myself, I didn't say it, I just thought it. I said, one day I may show you what I can do. And then years go by, and I venture go on to the service, come out and uh, go to junior college out in Arizona and go to the Bible school and transfer over to Southeastern and finally get a degree from OCU and I became a teacher. And it came into the El Reno Tribune paper and, you know, he subscribes to Mr. Durham. He's still a counselor. And uh, he's a history teacher, you know, a social studies teacher in El Reno High. He called me up 
and I was a PE teacher here. He said, well, he said, I lit a fire under you, didn't I? And he knew what he was doing. I said, yes, Mr. Durham. He said, you did. I said, when you said that, I said, I wanted to show you, and I did. He said, I want to come out and congratulate you. So he set up a little party for me down for El Reno High School and uh, told me what he had told me, and he challenged all the other students there that, you know, if they could do the same that I did. And, you know, my grandma, tutor always said, finish it or be finished by it. And I always said, I'm a, when I, once I started it, I had to finish it one or another. It took me six years to get my first degree, but I got it anyway. This guy's name, he's a movie star now. It was all playing at the Y, you know, in the summer of 1963 uh, or something. And we played a game of 21, you know, and, and if you keep winning, you get to play. So we got beat, so we're sitting down, and he was on my team, you know. And I knew him because he went to school at Phoenix Junior College, too. And uh, was all taking turns around. There was attorneys and, you know, uh, architects, you know, and businessmen and different things. And they come down to me and they say, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be a teacher. The one said, that's good. I said, great. And we got around, and said, we got around to this guy and he said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, I always wanted to go play football pro. pro. He said, I want to try it out at ASU, Arizona State University. He said, they cut me. He said, I was too slow. And he was all laughing. He said, oh, it's because you got bird legs. <laughs> we all laughed. He had skinny legs. You know, he's six feet, two inches tall, blonde and blue-eyed. He said, if I didn't make that, he said, now I'm going to go and roll in UCLA in their drama school, in acting. And he said, I'm going to become a movie star. And we said, oh, <laughs> get out of here. And a couple years later, I saw him on the tube. He is a movie star, Nick Nolte. <laughs> He's a personal friend of mine. 58, I got drafted, <clears throat> and uh, I went into the service in the Army and uh, went down to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, and did my basic there, and then I went AWOL. <laughs> went home on Christmas leave and didn't come back for, on the 29th day, and uh, they put me in another company. So all right, said, we're going to be sending your old outfit down to uh, Fort Hood, Texas. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to become a tank driver. And they kind of measured my shoulders. and said, no, it's not going to work. I said, you're not going to fit in an escape hatch. I said, it's not big enough for big people like you. I said, well, I want to go to become paratrooper. They said, you're too heavy for that. You're 215 pounds. <laughs> I said, okay. They said, well, and finally this guy, sergeant comes up. Well, send him to the second missile command. He said, can you drive a truck? I said, yes, sir. He said, don't call me sir, call me sergeant. So I got signed to the second missile command in Fort Hood, Texas. And that's where I spent the rest of my service time. And, and we transferred from Fort Hood to Fort Carson. And uh, I played service football there for two years. And uh, so that was the experience I had with playing football. There was one particular story that my grandmother always would tell us several times, you know, and it was about uh, this coyote uh, was sitting on a bank and he was, there was a stream of water and it kind of, the, the, the sun went down and, the, and he was sitting by the stream and the pool of backwater and there was kind of clear water and he was sitting there and he was very hungry. And he always, she, grandma always say, Okum, that means coyote. Okum is a, a high, like a high young. And he would say, he goes, coyote is very hungry, you know. And he could hear his stomach growling, you know. And he was sitting there looking down. He's, and all of a sudden, he saw this big old piece of bread come floating by, you know. You know and he, he said, well, he said, he said, now I've got something to eat. He's going to jump in and gr you know, grab that piece of bread floating by. And when he did, there was no bread, there was water. And he went down here several times. And the moral of the story, you can do it four times. So he went in the first, second, and third, and fourth time, he shouldn't have done it, his grandma says, because that's the end of uh, the moral story. So he jumps in and he drowns. And then when another coyote come by, he said, what was that coyote jumping in at the reflection of the moon? That's what it was. <laughs> he said, when you overdo it, something bad's gonna happen. 
And I said, oh, wow, I always remembered that. So that was one coyote you know, story about bread floating on the water and it was a reflection of the moon. And all those morals had four ties to them, they call, you know. And if somebody else had something to add, to I want to tie it on to this and go on with another story. And another one was uh, where this white man was selling uh, some flour and stuff for the, to the Indians. And so the Indians uh, in the camp baked some fry bread. And uh, this white man never had it before, so he said they gave it to him and he liked it. And so they kept giving him fry bread. And after one, by the third or fourth time, he ate too much. And the grease and all that got to him and gave him real bad indigestion. <laughs> and he said he overdid it. And so I said, that's, and said the moral is that the white men don't know when to stop. <laughs> that was the moral. Was, oh, wow. <laughs> they took me to the powwows and, you know, at uh, Sealing and also at Fonda, uh, the Sundance Arrow Worship. And uh, they wanted me to be traditional. But my mother and her were having, you know, different thoughts. My mother wanted to be educated. Grandparents then wanted to be the traditional Indian and become the Indian medicine man or chief, you know. And uh, so I went along with what my mother said because I got, got used to the idea because I was being influenced by the uh, Mennonite preacher that we were in church that we went to, and his name was Reverend Friesen, and he was, a, and he was telling me about church and education, you know, and I believe, began to believe him. And I began to see some of the things that our Indian medicine people were doing. Most of them were good, but some were not. And uh, what really turned me against it was my mother, and uh, my mother was adopted by my grandmother. My mother's a northern Cheyenne, so they adopted her when she was three years old, brought her down and raised her here in Oklahoma. So uh, they always had that little difference of, you know, a northern Cheyenne against a southern Cheyenne, and, you know, not really having a blood relative, but still she adopted her and raised her. And so uh, the argument was over a check that my grandma got for $75 a month. My mother said, we need some other, you know, some food. And grandma said, no, we're going to give it to these two uh, Montana Indian boys who come down to visit her. So she gave the whole check to them, and they got into argument. And my mother was really strong about it. She said, uh, it's okay, then if that's what you want to do, it, so you can all do your own cooking. And uh, they kind of start pushing and shoving each other, and finally uh, some of the people that were there, my father and cousins and those two Montana boys stopped them. And Grandma goes out. She pulls out her little paraphernalia knife, she goes out to the fence in the back. She's in two moons, hit that wire twice, three, four. She said, two moons, is it the white man's knife is going to cut on your body? And I told her, no, no, don't do that, please. I said, because I already had some training about what she was doing. She was putting a curse on my mother. And two months later, my mother had a tubular pregnancy, and she almost died. They had to go in and tie that two ball, to con and it came true. And I looked at my grandma and said, that's what you didn't do because you got mad being a medicine woman. I don't want to be a medicine man. I said, then I turned completely to education then. And uh, so my mother really started pushing that and I always went, did the best I could in school and so forth. So uh, I didn't want to become traditional after that. I was also taught uh, by my father, he said, he said, you can defeat the white man by using his own rules and games against himself. You can stand up to him. Because he had gone to a Bible uh, school up in Kansas when his father made him go to school. Uh, so he went to a prep school up there for the Mennonite church. And he said, once you learn what they had taught us, you learn the rules and regulations, laws, and said, use them against the white people too, but learn them well. And that's what I had learned to do. And I said, well, I started doing that. And I didn't back down from them. I stood up to them even though they kept putting me down, you know, and saying that I was a second class citizen. You know, I didn't believe I was, and I still don't believe I am. And I said, well, I was gonna do the best I can. 
And I went, when, when I eventually become a principal at Canton Public School, and I was taught and asked, how are you going to treat the whites? I said, I have to treat them equally. So because I married a white woman. They said, oh, they said, that's why we hired you. So what about your kids? I said, well, they're half Indian, half white. And I actually went to bat for the white students who were being put down by their own white race because, you know, being born on the wrong side of the railroad tracks and they were poor. And uh, the one that really sold me on the idea was this one kid. And uh, he went, he tested out to be a gifted and talented student. And the former gifted and talented student was a daughter of the president of Canton Bank. She was in the sixth grade. They thought she was going to get it, but I pushed for this poor white boy. And I really took a lot of flack from the white community because of that. And, uh, but he still got it. They're more traditional and uh, they speak their, their sign language a lot more than we do here down here in Oklahoma. Even though I'm half Northern Cheyenne because of my mother, and I spent a whole year going to school at Lame Deer, and I had to learn some of their traditional things that they did, you know. And, uh, but it was an experience too, and it really helped my Cheyenne language too. You know, because most of them are speaking Cheyenne at that time. This was during the 40s, late 40s, early 50s. And uh, so in Oklahoma, we were speaking basically English, you know. But, you know, some of us that were raised like grandpa and grandma, we had that experience of being taught uh, the Cheyenne language and the tr traditional culture traditions. It was an important part of our life. and. and letting us know where we came from and uh, what we were about originally and uh, knowing that I got the education too, you know, and I didn't realize that it was going to play a big part in uh, what I was going to be doing and the career that I was going to go into. It identifies you of who you were and all your culture and tradition and history of your people and use that you know, what, learn what you can from them. Don't lose the language. Don't lose the traditions. Go to the powwows. But also, you're living in a white man's world. Technology and everything is going to continue. Is that you can't change that, and so forth. Do the best you can in both. So we live in a dual world. So, but we can also excel in each one. And uh, basically, if you're going to be a career person, you know, you're going to have to do it the white man's way. And then going back and remember that you are part Indian, you know, or Cheyenne or Apple or whatever tribe you are. And it is important. And don't lose it. One thing I really strong against is alcohol or students using or children using alcohol or drugs. Those things are not good for you health wise. Being seventy seven years old, never used hardly any alcohol or drugs. I feel very privileged that the good Lord above has given me this many years in this kind of health and be able to do what I've done. And I'm not through yet. Uh, I'm still dreaming about uh, forming a you know, proposal or grant program for the assistant living center here in and around this immediate area in Concho. Because when I saw that one out at Clanton, I said, why can't we do that over there? Be the best you can. Set goals for yourself and achieve them step by step. That means you, you, know, you achieve one goal and you achieve it and go to the next one, the next one, and build yourself and finally you achieve a goal if that's what you really want. And you leave alcohol and drugs out of it and dedicate yourself to whatever you want to do. Believe what your elders tell you and your teachers, your professors, that you can be the best that you can be. I was just listening this morning on my morning devotion. I said, wow, the Lord, you have, you have blessed me. My cup truly ran over. I had 36 years with my wife until she passed away, four children, 11 great-grandchildren, and I'm real proud, you know, and the health that I'm enjoying right now. But I know I'm not winning, but I am a diabetic, but I'm doing the best I can with it. 
You can live with it. You can still do things and achieve things for yourself and others. Our elders are an important part of our community, providing them with information about available services as well as assistance in gaining access to those services is one of the main objectives of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Elder Program. Call 405-422-7571 for more information.